So, hello Boston, uh, and thank you all so much for indulging me today. Uh, this is my first time in Boston for about 22 years, uh, so it's a real privilege to be back. Uh, let's get started. If you're not here for this, you're in the wrong room. Uh, so you know how this goes. Uh, in summary, walk, don't run. Uh, follow the nearest exit sign uh, to the concourse. Uh, and head downwards towards the stairwell and the street level. And uh, please remember to remove any high heels or whatever uh, so that you don't tear the emergency slide on the way out. That would just spoil the fun for everyone else. So if you just want to zone out and catch the gist of what I'm talking about, here's a GitHub repository. You might want to take a snap of this, or if you're type quick enough typing, uh, go grab it now. We're going to talk about this towards the end of the uh, presentation. So a quick introduction to me. My name is Alan. I work at Pivotal as a principal technical instructor based out of London. I am the primary contributor to a course known as PCF Admin or Operator, soon to be. Uh, I consider myself to be very lucky in this industry. I, I do for a living what I used to do for a hobby. Uh, so hence the comment there about the 10-year-old hacker. Uh, I used to work in finance. I wrote trading systems for investment banks for years and uh, then more recently became an instructor. Uh, and it's a great path, by the way. If you ever fancy doing that, that's a, a really uh, a great path to take. Uh, I'm interested in all things cloud native these days, and I use a little bit of whatever makes it work. So I don't consider myself to be an expert in anything in particular. Um, I just get the job done. I'm expecting that you are existing or pivotal customers. Uh, I would say that you're probably looking at cloud native at scale. Uh, you might consider yourself rock stars. I'll let you decide. Uh, you could be interested in automation or just nervously curious about this type of stuff. Or you could be a fellow educator, in which case this might also help you. Uh, friends and colleague as well, thanks for coming along. So I'm hoping that some of these bullet points will resonate with you. Uh, we want to achieve operational efficiency and develop a productivity, perhaps even operational productivity as well. Who knows? Uh, we want to make our actions repeatable. We don't want to have to repeat our actions, because that sounds like toil. We don't like that. Uh, we'd like to embrace the command line interface, your operators, I'm guessing. So you're probably there already. And we're thinking that maybe we want to leverage some of this CI, CD tooling that's been around in the application space for so many years. Part of, my, uh, part of the reasoning for this talk here was I wanted to bridge a gap between Staying manual with the ops manager and just dipping your toes into platform automation. I think there's this gap between what you can do very easily by standing up PCF and what you can do if you go to all the concourse talks. And they'll, they'll talk to you forever about all the wonderful things that they're doing. And I think it's quite difficult to make that leap. So I just want to dip my toes in. So I'm an educator, so that's my challenge on a day-to-day -day basis, is by stepping people through slowly in a way that is uh, meaningful to them. Uh, I think some of the solutions that are out there are fairly opaque. Um, they may involve you learning more languages. Uh, you don't necessarily want to do that. Uh, and I think, I feel quite strongly that their version of vanilla might be different to yours and to me. Uh, you might want to do something that's very particular to your industry uh, and your uh, environment, uh, and it's important to stay flexible with regard to that. Because uh, there's no one-size-fits-all solution here. Now, maybe I'm part of the problem by putting this presentation together. I'll leave you to decide. So I picked up on a couple of educational use cases here. One involves the operators. The other is the uh, developers themselves. Uh, for the operators, we tend to give them a blank environment and say, hey, stand up a, a platform. And for the developers, it's the instructor's, instructor's responsibility on, say, a Sunday night to stand up a platform so they can use it on the Monday. And in the first case, we find that the student's experience is rather error prone because we're teaching them manually how to use the ops manager. And in the second case, 
the instructors find it rather boring to waste their Sunday uh, manually standing up an environment which you feel like you should be able to do better whilst con uh, maintaining control of that environment. So automation can help with this, but it's not, it doesn't have to be a binary choice. Uh, you don't have to have everything manual versus everything automated. You can mix and match, and you can see cause and effect, and I think that's an important educational tool. So, so I wanted to make use of automation uh, for both the instructors and the students, and uh, this work that I'm working on now, this, this presentation, is helping inform some of our future direction with regard to uh, initial client engagements and education in general. I'm hoping there might be something in here for you as well. So a couple of the items that we will be covering, I think it's important to know uh, what the boundaries are here in 30 minutes, it's not long, not long to work with. Uh, Ops Manager UI on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, we're gonna look at the OM and the PivNet CLI tools, briefly. We're gonna talk probably a little bit more about the underlying APIs for those tools. And a couple of bash scripts, that w bash scripts which will help us glue it all together. We're going to be swerving platform upgrades. I think there's other talks to, uh, to deal with this. Uh, we're also not going to talk about Bosch. Ops Manager is an abstraction upon Bosch, so we'll leave that to uh, the big boys. And uh, I will concentrate on the, 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 uh, the top layer that we have. Uh, concourse, I'm not going to go into detail there. Uh, if you want to grab your time machine and go back to yesterday, you'll find a nice talk about the concourse platform by uh, Yuri, Therese, and Ryan. Uh, we're also not going to talk about other IaaS's. The whole point of having the platform is that we are abstracted from that. So this is a familiar view to you of the Ops Manager installation dashboard. It has things that are green and things that are orange, and our task is to turn orange things green so we can hit the big blue button. It's very heavily mouse and keyboard orientated, uh, so, uh, but it does allow you to have full configuration over the tiles which we download from Pivotal Network. More about that later. Some of the justification for using the Ops Manager. Well, Bosch is hard. Um, the Ops Manager isolates you from Bosch. Uh, Bosch is all about distributed systems. We know they're tough, and the barriers to entry are very high. Uh, we could use a hand in this respect. A typical Bosch manifest could potentially be thousands of lines of YAML. Um, I'm not sure about you, but I see YAML as a bit of a, an ugly baby. Uh, it's not really uh, uh, doing it for me right now, but who knows, I might get there. Um, and and I'm, I'm slightly concerned that actually a lot of that complexity is difficult. You realize it's very hard to retain your best staff but only your best staff are gonna really be able to get their hands dirty on a daily basis with something as dangerous as Bosch. So isolation from Bosch is one aspect of using the Ops Manager, but it's not enough justification. We need more. And that's where Pivotal Network comes in. So the Ops Manager works in conjunction with PivNet, and this is where the Ops Manager for me really shines, is that collaboration between the two pieces. Uh, PivNet is a one-stop shop for products as well as third-party offerings, and it provides us with shrink-wrapped uh, Bosch deployments for easy consumption uh, through that Ops Manager interface. Uh, another key part here is that Pivotal attempts to uh, respond to critical vulnerabilities within 48 hours, uh, but that is on the assumption that you're using PivNet. If you're using PivNet, the assumption is you're also using the Ops Manager, so these two things go together. But let's be pragmatic about this for a second. There are some concerns that come with all of this niceness. Uh, the web interface appears to make our configuration seem easy. It's not. It's still hard. We still need to understand about the detail. Web page form validation won't catch everything. Sure, you can put a regular expression against an email address and check that that actually looks like a regular expression. But what does that mean to the outside world? It doesn't matter. If it's wrong, it's wrong, uh, and you're still going to get it wrong, and that could end in uh, a, a silent failure, which is probably worse than a catastrophic failure, because you won't find out about it until much later. So it's important to protect ourselves from fat fingers. Um, trust me, I work in the field with lots of students, and uh, 
Uh, for them, it's like a week off work to do some, do some funky stuff, and they forget how to type quite a lot. Uh, sorry, <laughs> that's, that's the truth. Um, operations staff often prefer using the command line. This is an important point. And uh, there's a various other reasons why uh, we have alternate viewpoints about the operations manager itself. So we want to narrow the scope for error here. And uh, we want to find out if there's a better way of doing this without losing all the benefits that I just described. So in this typical configuration, the browser is obviously on your laptop. And it could be uh, sat on my lap on a plane above the Atlantic, which it was a couple of days ago when I wrote these slides. Um, the bandwidth requirements here in the browser are quite high because I need to download from PivNet, which is essentially a database, in order to import to Ops Manager, which is essentially a database. So I've got a lot of data flying around on networks, and that increases the local bandwidth requirements. A better solution is to uh, use a, a jump box as our primary interface via SSH. So if we put the jump box into the cloud alongside uh, the other two databases, uh, this, this, this helps us uh, reduce the, the local bandwidth requirements. The jump box itself could be a Windows machine, but it's typically a headless Linux box. Uh, so the bad news is now that our comfort blanket has gone. We don't have a browser anymore. So we're going to talk a little bit about APIs. Um, we can consider our own applications that we use as abstractions that help us get our work done. Similarly, APIs are abstractions that help our applications get their work done. So there's like a chain of command here or onion ring architecture. There's definitely layers involved. And we want to peel off a couple of those layers. So in this case, we're looking at the CFCLI. You're probably familiar with this. Uh, so the top command there is just a, a CF domains. Uh, that's going to do what it does and brings back some results and prettify the output. If you inject the CF trace flag, this allows you to see what cloud controller APIs are being called under the hood. So the CFCLI is an example of a command line tool which abstracts an API, makes it more digestible. The Apps Manager, if you're familiar with that, is using the exact same API. So different applications, the same API. And it turns out that the Ops Manager is another example of an abstraction over an API. So back to a traditional uh, um, uh, view that you might have of the operations manager. I can tell you that this is not the path to operational efficiency. This is a nice starting point. If you take a look to the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you'll see a link through to API docs. It's kind of hidden away, but it's there. And if you click that link, it will take you straight down a rabbit hole. And it will take some time, but it's worth the investment. So we're going to see what's behind that link and try and take the cover off the ops manager. So historically, APIs weren't built around standardized wire protocols. We used statically linked libraries, uh, often using exotic <coughs> data types, which made them uh, difficult to consume. I'm looking at C++ here, by the way. Uh, loosely coupled. REST APIs built on top of HTTP uh, help us enormously. But the details can get really scary. We have to deal with things like headers and authentication, uh, payloads and formatting. And in the post-XML world, where we're wholly dependent on good documentation, shall I finish that sentence? <laughs> it's difficult to know sometimes what you can and can't do. You don't necessarily have the best uh, uh, um, help available to you all the time. And it feels like you're scrabbling about in the dark a lot of the time. So CLIs might be able to help us. Uh, if you take a look at this screenshot from the first page of the Ops Manager API, which is accessible at slash docs, this is us down that rabbit hole looking at a post method for slash API v0 installations. And this endpoint represents the apply changes button. So if you send a post message to this endpoint, it will actually 
effectively click that button for you. Now, if the slash API v0 uh, syntax there seems familiar, you're not wrong. You have seen this before. Do you remember the first time you used the CFCLI and you had to extract the admin password? And you had to go digging into the credentials. And then you said, I want to find the admin credentials for UAA, this strange thing called UAA. And up, pop, up popped a screen that looked like JSON. And if you look carefully at the address bar now, you'll see in there slash API slash zero, V0. You've seen this before. We've probably been using this lots of times. And what's happening here is that the ops manager is saying, you're cool. You know what you're doing. So I'm going to lift the lid for you. So I'm going to now assist the ops manager in lifting the lid a little bit more. So it's worth mentioning here that the ops manager is not alone. Uh, PivNet has also got an API, and that's critical to this. But more about that one later. Focusing our attention on the director tile, the IaaS tile, the thing that abstracts you from the infrastructure, uh, we have here uh, two views upon the same information. And I've picked on this one, um, the VM uh, Resurrector plugin, because it's disabled by default. One of the first things you'll do is probably come in here and click that box. Now, if you want to see what that looks like in slash API v0 format, take a look at the link that I've put up on the page. If you pop that into a browser, because it's an authorized GET request, it can just pull back that information for you. And you'll be able to see whether the checkbox has been clicked or not, because it will say it's true or it's false. So we're starting to lift the lid. Moving our attention to the products, and in this case, we've got MySQL, but it could be any product. We find that the product configuration behind the product tiles is broadly subdivided into four parts, each with their own endpoints. So the network co config uh, endpoint is where we can configure uh, our tiles to isolate certain workloads. The errands endpoint is where we can uh, configure one-off tasks like pushing the apps manager and registering a service broker, for instance. The resource config is where we size our VMs and scale horizontally our, ski, our, our VMs. And our products, uh, sorry, our properties um, uh, endpoint, which is the big group in the center, which is product specific. And it represents arbitrary groupings of properties that relate to, in this case, MySQL. Now, these endpoints are all accessible via a browser, so you can see these. Uh, so we've covered GET requests quite easily in the browser. The important thing now is to know how to actually make a modification using these same endpoints. So returning to the director tile, uh, we're going to show you one half of a set of CRUD operations. There's a GET and a PUT combination for that checkbox that we were talking about. Now, we don't need to see all of the director uh, configuration. We just need to see the elements that have changed. Um, so that's why uh, the last line there, when we're performing the put operation, is just a very small snippet of the full set of properties. Notice also at the top how much work is required to authenticate us. We have to use the CF uh, UAC. Uh, command line tool, or the CUAC command line tool, to um, authenticate ourselves with the ops manager. This is going to produce us a token that we can pass around on a header, but it's detail that we don't really want to have to worry about. So that was us looking at ops manager. We said we need to uh, gain control or API control over the, the Pivotal network as well. Uh, so it's a similar story when interacting with PivNet. Uh, and in all these examples, we're just using basic curls. We want to try and simulate a typical workflow that you might encounter when using Pivotal Network. I want to search for a product. Well, the first line is searching for MySQL. Uh, the second line is looking for the latest download available. And then once you've got that, you need to accept the EULA. At this point, you need your PivNet API token. You can get that from PivNet. And then finally, you need to download the product. 
And the, the download's going to take some time, uh, but at least now it can come to your jump box and not to the browser. So we spent a bit of time talking about the APIs there, and we looked at curl, and we talked about the problems of using authentication uh, and using payloads. Uh, and we want a bit of help. So it was rather painful doing it that way. Uh, we'd rather use an abstraction, something like a CLI. So shown here from top to bottom, again, is a typical workflow. Downloading from PivNet, uploading to the Ops Manager, before being configured and finally deployed uh, with the equivalent of an Apply Changes button click. The APIs work fine, but the CLIs are just nicer to use. Well, I've done all the hard work for you. Uh, so there's a lot of information in this repo, which I encourage you to take a look at. Uh, I would definitely look at the readmes. It's, gone, it's going to tell you how to set up the jump box, how to set up the ops manager, and how to start making use of these scripts and introduce you to the configs uh, which whose sole responsibility is turning orange things green. So if we're using the APIs or indeed CLIs directly, we need to provide lots of contextual info on every call that we make. My scripts abstract this away into variables which capture the specifics of your own environment. And this is what the typical environment file might look like. So from an empty uh, ops manager to a fully operational Elastic Runtime, or PaaS, uh, in eight lines of Bash script. Uh, that's, that sounds a bit grand. But actually, behind these scripts, in some cases, it's really just a one-liner. What I'm trying to do is abstract away all of that authentication stuff, the bit that makes your six-character line become 600 characters. Uh, first one, authenticate, uh, configure authentication. So this is setting up the admin account on your ops manager. Uh, secondly, configure the director tile. It's important to do that in isolation because other tiles have uh, important dependencies, like on the networks, the things that have been uh, decided in your abstraction across the network, networking down to the uh, infrastructure. Uh, then we're going to need to set, uh, create a key. There's a bunch of different ways we can do this, but I've thrown in a, a script there uh, which generates a, a self-signed certificate. And then we're going to import the product, stage the product, configure the product, and apply the changes. In this case, the product is Elastic Runtime, uh, and that's the, uh, the little uh, elements you see in yellow there. We're interested in things called product slugs, product versions, and product file IDs. We'll come back to that in a second. Well, what we get from using this, it gives us the ability, uh, the flexibility, uh, to tailor this for your own requirements. So if you want different config, you can write different config. If you want uh, different products, you can wire up different products. The ability to learn by seeing stepwise causality is really important. In an environment where we're trying to teach people, I think it's, 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 it's dangerous to give them a black box and expect them to be a master of everything. You want to encourage them to experiment. And I think that's what giving the, them these scripts does. Or, uh, it just lifts the lid a little bit. On the next page, we'll talk a bit more about those uh, yellow environment variables, just because I think that needs clarification. These environment variables are in addition to the variables which describe your environment, so they're product specific. And if you want to find out how to identify the slug version and file ID, you take a look at these magic numbers in Pivotal Network. That's where you're going to get this stuff from. Uh, this screenshot comes from the README in the repo, so we've got it in there as well. Pick these values out, put them in the variables, inject them, call the script, and the rest is just done for you. Um, so I've got a few minutes now just to do a little demo. I might need to reconsider uh, my configuration here. So I'm going to try and mirror my screens. Different resolutions, so I need to change that. Put that down there. And these up here. Fingers crossed. So firstly, uh, I'll start with 
I'll start with a working uh, environment. So I've got three environments here. This is a fully working environment, and I'm going to show you my favorite setting of all in the Elastic Runtime or PAS tile. Uh, it's this X button, you, this X setting that you need to specify that you acknowledge and you understand this message, which obviously we've all read. Um, th this X is obviously data. It sits in a database somewhere. I want to try and locate that piece of information. So if I cut across here, I can navigate to, I don't know how easy it is to see that, I can navigate here to API v0 staged products. And in doing so, I can find out what the GUIDs are for the installations that I have available here. So in this case, interestingly, it's, it considers the, uh, the IaaS tile, the, uh, the Bosch Director tile, as a product, and sometimes they're not considered to be a product, but here they're considered to be a product. It's certainly an installation, and it has a GUID. But I'm interested in this CF one, which corresponds to the PAS tile. Now, if I cut across to uh, uh, this screen here, you'll see that all I've done is I've just extended that product to include the GUID that I've just pulled out. And if I, ah, uh, yeah, if I do this one, uh, it's going to tell me, again, this is, this is the correct one. This is the installation that you were looking for. And now I can start looking at things like those. Remember I said each product has got like four subdivisions of config? Uh, so I can start looking at things like properties. And properties is going to bring back all of the properties that exist for, in this case, the PAS tile. And as luck would have it, a quoted X is the only, is only, only appears once. So if I scan down through the file, I'm going to very quickly see which key value pair it is. So if I wanted to automate this, that's the key I'm looking for. Yeah? OK, so I'm going to move on to a couple of environments which need configuration. In this one, nothing has been set up yet. So I need to firstly uh, set up uh, authentication. I need to configure authentication. And we've seen we've got a script for that. And really, under the hood, I promise you, you can have a look at this. It's, all, it's on, only making a very simple call down to the OM, but we're not having to pass all these variables to it because the scripts make sure that they're available and injected in. Let's make sure I'm on the right environment. Uh, I want to, how much time have I got? I can't see now. Yeah, I've got a few minutes. Uh, right, so I want to configure this authentication. Uh, first thing I should do while I'm here is I just, I just proved to you that I've got uh, some environment variables. Uh, so if I just pull out the first four lines of this file, you'll see that I've got some environment variables in here. I'm going to not show you my password. And now that I've shown you that, I can show you which scripts I have available because I've cloned this repo. So there's the scripts. Those, those are the, uh, the scripts that are available to you. I want something called config, configure authentication. So I'm going to fire that one off straight away. It's just scripts configure authentication.sh. And I think it's got everything it needs. Just double check. Spring one. Yep, this is the right environment. So this is going to take a little while. While this is doing this, I'm, I'm going to flick across to my second environment, which has already been pre-configured. So in this second environment, we'll see nothing has been turned green yet, but I do have a bunch of imported tiles. I did this import because the imports take forever. Um, some of these downloads are like 10 gigs. That's why you don't want it on your laptop. But it also, also takes time to get it installed in the Ops Manager. So I've done that hard work for us. What needs to happen now, the very first thing, is I've got to configure that director tile. So if I flick over to my second environment here, and again, just double check that I'm, I've got the right settings in here. That looks like spring two, so that looks correct to me. And I'm going to run uh, scripts uh, configure director. And this, again, has everything it needs. It's all built in there. It's got the environment variable to tell me Tell, it, tell the script which environment it's targeting, and it's referencing um, 2.1 configuration. 
so the configuration matches the version that you're targeting. Now, this again is going to take a few seconds. So while this happens, uh, I'm just going to throw it open to the room. Is there any questions at all? I've got a microphone if, uh, if somebody wants to come and grab this. Please, can you? They won't be able to record it on the recording. Let's get this down to you. It's a little switch at the bottom. Hi. Is there any thoughts around the multiple tile deployments through Opsman? Multiple. Right now it's all, it's all uh, single threaded, like sequentially uh, one after another. Like right now you have one tile. Yeah. What about if you have 10? Is there any thoughts around running multiple at once? So as I understand, the, uh, the tiles themselves uh, uh, do have some interdependencies. So it's, uh, it, the, the, there's a degree of parallelization which could occur. Uh, but I'm not aware of any anything that's been done to um, make that happen. No, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, that looks like it's configured the first tile, and it looks like the second piece. Right, so let's go back to uh, uh, the Spring 1 environment here. And if I do a quick refresh, you'll see that this has been configured. I'll know it's been configured because uh, it will be asking me for a login. And it has, so that's configured the tile. In the second example, I, com I configured the... Uh, the director tile, so a refresh there is going to tell me that that's gone green. And now I can choose any one of these products. Um, I think I'll go for something really simple like, I don't know, MySQL. Let's do that. Um, so actually, I think I've got an example in here. So cat builder. Which one am I looking at? No, wrong environment. Oh, I'm going to use the, uh, the do the PAS. So I'm using the imported name. Now, this could be different from the downloaded name. The, there's a script here to help me. If I say uh, dot slash scripts uh, list imports, this is going to make a call down into the OM to tell me which items I, f I should find available for me to stage. So you'll see that CF is in there, and the product version is 211. So I can create those variables and import them into the stage product script. Now when I do this, it should happen fairly quickly. And as I flick back to the, the other screen and do a refresh, you'll see that the PAS tile has come in. There's a orange PAS tile. If I jump back in to my bash uh, shell, my SSH session, I can now configure that product again by combining my variables with my script and the config that knows how to configure a 2.1 tile. And after a little while, remember it's got a few bits to do here. It's got to set the properties, set the network, set the errands, and set the resource config. There's a fair bit to do, but after a couple of seconds, you'll see it now working through uh, the VMs and sizing them and setting up load balancers as well. Uh, anything that you might want to do is available via the API. And that's done now. So if I now refresh that, you'll notice, again, gone green. I haven't touched the UI at all. And the final step is, <laughs> it's gone to sleep. Come on. Scripts, apply changes, dot sh. And that is going to kick off the big blue button. I'm going to come back to that before I finish. I'm going to wrap up very quickly. Uh, I have now, uh, I think, yeah, I've got to wrap up really quickly. So let's see if I can get this working. Great, OK. So where to next? Uh, if you want to learn about concourse, lots of people are talking about concourse ne uh, now, so go dip your toes in there, see where that takes you. Uh, PCF pipelines, if you want to consolidate some of what you've learned into uh, 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 pipelines that you can put into concourse, uh, go for that. Uh, Dell's Pivotal Ready Architecture, uh, this is a fairly new offering uh, in the on-prem space. Uh, so we have... Uh, we have William with us, um, and if you want to speak to him, I think he's in the room, he might have gone. There he is, William. Uh, otherwise, um, go catch him down at the, the, uh, the Dell booth. 
Um, and uh, where next? Well, maybe you want to go to Washington, because we'll be there in September. Um, and here's a discount code if you want to get some money off the ticket price. So just to finish off, if I do a refresh here, I'm hoping that this should be mid-install. And sure enough, it's on its way. OK, I am done. I'm out of here. Thank you very much, Boston. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Thank you very much.